Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of Trojan Conquest Live tonight. Obviously, Matt, Mark's not with us, but Matt and I will do our best to keep up the standard. Matt, how are you doing this evening? Doing all right, Tim. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's another slow week, but hey, pro day is around the corner at USC. Spring ball, not that far away. We're getting to the point where we're going to have a lot of news. But this week, you know, not a heavy news week for USC football. There is heavy news. Your guy Tim here got his uh, official word. I've been going to the basketball on a credential, but I just got my official word today that I will be receiving the football credential. So we're going to get a little more back uh, behind the scenes stuff here at Trojan Conquest Live. Um, looking forward to it, starting with possibly pro day. I might be going to pro day, but definitely uh, fall camp and um, you know spring ball. I know that the, usually the practices are closed to the media. But there, you know, there will be opportunities to speak with the team and the coaches, as well as uh, the game. I believe the spring games on the twentieth. Is that right? No, no, that's not right. A April twentieth, I believe, is the spring game. I'll, I'll double check that for you, Matt. Do you remember? Uh, it, it, it the twentieth doesn't sound right because I think the twenty. Uh, well, no, no, the twentieth is a Saturday, so yeah, that sounds right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, except for uh, April, I, I did double check it. It didn't sound right to me either, but it is. It's uh, it's April twentieth because the the um pro day is on March twentieth. So yeah, it, it kind of all lines up. So like Matt said, not a lot of news really going through. We got you know some recruiting whispers, but nothing really solid to report on. But what we can talk about is what's going on in the NFL. Um, our guy, a fan favorite, definitely a fan favorite of mine. Uh, is going to get paid and get paid very, very well. Uh, Michael Pittman Jr. Uh, is going to sign another contract. Remember, you guys, this is what it is. So everyone talk about this NIL, NIL, NIL. NIL is peanuts. This is like, it's poverty money, those millions. right? Hard to say. But really what you want to do is you want to get drafted, get drafted high, and then the big bucks comes in that second contract. And that's what um, is happening for Michael uh, Pittman Jr., He's got a three-year deal worth up to $71.5 million, uh, with $46 million of that being guaranteed money, according to a uh, Bleacher Report. Uh, it just goes to show you, we you know, USC has been arguing wide receiver U with just the, the guys are cranking out, and you look at these young bumper crop of wide receivers we have now, it's not going to slow down anytime soon, Matt. Uh, it's not the, like this is a this is a position group where USC uh, is not hurting. It's not lacking. Uh, I know that their production wasn't fantastic last season, but, you know, with Zachariah Branch uh, improving the precision of his route running and just polishing his game, he should be set for a huge 2024. And then, you know, we saw in the Holiday Bowl, uh, Jacoby Lane, Makai Lemon, like th those guys showed off their athleticism and their hands. And uh, it's really, really exciting uh, to look forward to what USC has in the wide receiver room for this season going into the Big Ten. Speaking just about Pittman, you know, Pittman has a has a good offensive coach, head coach, uh, Shane Steichen in, uh, in uh, Indianapolis. So it's a good fit. It's a good situation. Like he has a play caller and a structure that worked for him. And of course, he's getting paid too, and he totally deserves it. He has earned it. He's been a really uh, strong player. So, like this works really on a lot of different levels uh, for the Colts for Michael Pittman. It's a win-win for everybody. And a uh, lot of lot of news in the NFL, right, uh, Matt? What did you want? You also you were talking earlier about the NFL. What what else? What are Trojan news we got going on in the NFL? Well, there, there's a lot of different things, but I mean, let, just at the start, let's also touch on the, the fact that Kirk Cousins goes to the Falcons. So that's going to help our man Drake London. You know, he's no longer having uh, Desmond Ritter throwing him the ball or any of the other uh, struggle bus quarterbacks that the Falcons have had. Now he gets Kirk Cousins. And I mean, hey, I mean, Kirk Cousins is not an elite quarterback, but he's a good quarterback. He's a good, solid quarterback, can make a lot of things happen, and he's obviously a dramatic upgrade from Desmond Ritter and anyone else uh, the Falcons have. So Drake London, he should be better because his quarterback is going to be better. 
His offense is going to be better. So so great to see Drake London getting some real help uh, in Atlanta. That should definitely be a significant boost uh, to his NFL career. We love to see that. Yeah. I, one position, well, two positions lately, actually, has been quarterback and wide receiver. That's the one thing at USC you just don't have to really worry about. USC is turning out NFL quality, and they're getting top – wide receivers and quarterbacks each year. Um, that's one thing I believe with also now that we have Lincoln Riley, not going to slow down anytime soon. Uh, any other NFL news you want to hit on Matt? Well, let's do one more. And that is that, uh, you know, the, uh, the Raiders picked up Gardner Minshew and why, why does that have anything to connect to USC? It's because Justin Fields, the guy the Bears are ostensibly going to get rid of to make way for Caleb Williams, he still doesn't have a team. And the Raiders were floated as one of the teams that Justin Fields uh, might land on. So Justin Fields right now is stuck. And from what I see, from what I sense, from what I read, there's no clear-cut consensus on exactly where Justin Fields is going to go. And, I mean, and if you're the Bears and, like, the, it just – interrupt for a little bit the bears are not a well-run organization um but but even just taking that into account um if the bears are to make way for caleb williams like they've they've said they want to get rid of justin fields they want to deal him get a decent return and that's really the sticking point the bears are finding it hard to get what they feel is a legitimate return uh, in a trade for Justin Fields. The market is not very hot for him right now. So, you know, <laughs> if the Bears can't unload Justin Fields, then what are they going to do? And that's where uh, all the intrigue comes in uh, for Caleb Williams. So, you know, what seemed to be a pretty clear-cut situation two weeks ago, you know, Bears are definitely going to draft Caleb. They're definitely going to deal Justin Fields. Might still happen, and, and in fact, if you said that, that this is still going to happen, no one should worry. I wouldn't distrust you. I'd be, I'd be inclined to still believe you, but it seems a little stickier right now. It seems a little more uh, uncertain, and I, I would just add on top of this that if the Bears can't get rid of Justin Fields and they get really, really stuck, you know, then they might have to trade that number one pick for all those assets. And let's remember, the Bears have the number nine pick. So like that they you know, like they can get uh, if they if they do uh, get stuck with Justin Fields they can get you know Rome Odunze uh, with that number nine pick Odunze might be on the board by then uh, you know Marvin Harrison Jr. is probably going to be the first receiver off the board he's probably going to go top five but uh, you know like if the Bears realize oh geez we can't get anything in return for Justin Fields um then you know dealing the number one pick for an avalanche of assets might be the way they have to go i'm not going to say it's the way they should go but they might feel that that is the only card they have left to play so this has gotten a little interesting with you know the flurry of nfl uh free agent moves so caleb williams might not be headed for chicago after all and i'm on record just in case anyone hasn't uh, heard me say this i'm on record as saying if I'm the Minnesota Vikings, and it's, it's especially true now that Kirk Cousins is out, just to kind of circle back on that. If I'm the Vikings, I put all my poker chips in the middle of the table for Caleb Williams. Like I give up my left arm and my right knee. I give up a lot for Caleb Williams because, you know, if you can throw to Jordan Addison and Justin Jefferson behind what is a decent offensive line, for a head coach, Kevin O'Connell, who, you know, seems to get it offensively and have a coherent uh, offensive structure and, and, and approach. Uh, and, of course, Brian Flores, the defensive coordinator, dramatically improved the Vikings defense last season. Man, I'm just I just need that franchise quarterback if I'm the Vikings. So I give up plenty uh even to the bears like if it I, you know i might be doing a trade within my division but i move heaven and earth for caleb williams if i'm the minnesota vikings that's the team that ju just thinking in terms of what's best for caleb williams and what would be a fantastic fit for him i'd love to see the vikings just put all the chips in the middle of the table 
uh, in a mega deal for that number one pick in Caleb Williams. So with Justin Fields remaining stuck and the clock ticking and the Bears not seemingly getting any kind of market return for Fields, it's getting a little bit more uncertain and uh, it invites the possibility of, of, a, of a splash deal emerging for Caleb Williams. Oh, definitely be interesting. I've, I Trojan fans will be eyes on for Caleb, hoping he does get to um, a solid team. It would be interesting. You're, you're right. I mean, if they could trade and get maybe some, not only that, to so get a receiver, you say Romo Dunze, but also pick up like a nice uh, a tackle prospect or something, something to protect. So he's not, so he has a little protection. He's not running for his life back there. It would be uh, would helpful in Chicago as well. Well, we did tease it a little bit in the title, but Matt, I did want to talk about. Uh, Spring ball. Spring ball is coming up faster than you guys can imagine. In a couple of weeks here, um, we're, we're going to be looking at uh, spring football. Uh, you know, There is no real offseason, but if there is an offseason, as soon as spring ball hits, it's over as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's going to be great to see with the whole new coaching staff coming on the defense side of the ball. Uh, the, there's going to be some names that are going to emerge. Some maybe fixtures might get swapped out. A lot's going to be happening this year in spring ball. And probably, I would say, one of the most dramatic positions to watch is going to be that inside linebacker position. You're going to see uh, you got a, a lot of talent there uh, at the linebacker position. But USC brought in some guys. And one of the guys that they did bring in um, to the linebacker was uh, Easton Macarius Arnold. This guy is a first-team all-pack 12 linebacker. It came down. From Oregon State, and uh, he's going to be in the mix right away. Just like we brought over Mason Cobb, who was uh, an all-conference linebacker from the Big 12. Uh, they're going to be battling it out with, I had in the cover there, Eric Gentry. Um, and and uh, we'll get to him in a little bit. But, you know, someone I want to see, I really do think is going to thrive under Entz, Matt, is going to be a, a guy that, whenever he's been given a chance, has done nothing but just perform. Um, and so I want to see what Rajon Davis can do with Matt Entz in this system because the kid, he is talented. He's fast. He's strong. He has everything you need. He's tough. He keeps his mouth shut, keeps his head down. He just keeps plugging away. I, you know, I wouldn't have blamed him a couple of times. There's, he could have gone on, on, to a school and started last year if he wanted to bail. But this guy really wants to be a Trojan, uh, and I, I think that he's going to get a really good look this spring. Matt, any ideas and thoughts on the, uh, the linebacker room going into spring ball? Well, I think the, first, the the starting point has to be this. You know, some people will say Mason Cobb was not actually that good a player. Well, you know, he was a very good player at Oklahoma State. And why did it not work out for him <laughs> at USC? I have six letters for you. G-R-I-N-C-H. What does that spell? Grinch. You know, so... People, I think, were led to think, uh, at least to a certain degree, that these players were busts. These players, you know, just didn't measure up. No, they were. They, they actually just weren't coached really well. Because what would, I mean, we'll never know the answer to this, but what would Mason Cobb do with a Danton Lynn system and Matt Entz as linebacker coach, right? And so... That's, to me, the salient comparison. It's not so much to say, well, Mascarenas Arnold is going to be good, whereas Mason Cobb wasn't. That might actually be true, but it won't be because Mason Cobb was this overrated fraud player. It's because you actually have good coaches now. <laughs> you actually have good credentialed, proven coaches on the defensive side of the ball, guys who actually will develop talent. And the other thing is, as we all know, that Alex Grinch played Tackett Curtis way too much and Rayshon Davis far too little. You know, Rayshon Davis just couldn't get enough reps under Alex Grinch, no matter no matter what he did. Like Alex Grinch would not give Davis the light of day. And you would think that if Rayshon Davis is, is everything that a lot of USC fans uh, think he is and can be, that Matt Entz, uh, you know, in consultation with, Danton Lynn, Eric Henderson, the rest of the staff, you know, in this new collaborative model we've been talking about in which Lincoln Riley has emphasized, you know, it's not just going to be one guy's 
decision the way it was with Alex Grinch. Now it's going to be a, a it's it's going to require a village, everyone consulting and being together on the same page. If um, everyone on that defensive staff, you know, can see that Rayshon Davis has the makings of something special, he will get the reps, he will get the snaps, and so you're you're not just going to get the better player development but you're likely to get much better decision-making in terms of who gets more snaps and who doesn't. And that was another big whiff from the staff last season, that it wasn't just that they didn't teach players well enough, that they didn't develop players well enough, but they weren't putting the right players on the field. <laughs> you know, a pretty elemental part of coaching that you need to pick the guys you know, who are the best and who deserve the spot the most, you know, to start or, and get most of the snaps so those are all ingredients to throw into the pot in terms of why uh, this linebacker group and these specific linebackers are going to be better. Thank God they're not going to be coached by Alex Grinch. No, they're going to be coached by you know a much better uh, linebacker coach, Matt Entz, under a much better staff with you know co-coordinators, Danton Land and Eric Henderson. All of that needs to be factored into the mix. It's not just Mason Cobb was bad. Mascarenas Arnold can be good. That's a facile and, and flawed uh, comparison. We shouldn't go down that kind of rabbit hole. No, it's going to be a the competition and those inside linebacker positions are going to be fierce. Um, you know, it's the Mike and, and Will positions will be filled out. I ask you guys right now, if you guys want to, go ahead. Let's do a little popularity contest. I'm curious what a lot of you guys, I mean, I, I recognize all the faces out there. Who do you guys think are going to be our two inside linebackers? Uh, do you, do you think it's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to wait, but I want you guys to throw it out there if you want to go on record. But one thing that we need to remember in an interview on two, four, seven, uh, this week, uh, Danton Lynn talked about the fact that, uh, Eric Gentry, uh, right. Who, who is a physical freak and you have to find when you have a, you know, a physical freak on your team, you need to find a role for a guy like him. You know, he shines a freshman down at Arizona state. Plays, played here, played really well, then kind of got a little bit banged up, a little bit undersized, a little bit thin frame, but he's getting bigger. Matter of fact, Lynn said he's gotten bigger since he's been here uh, in the interview. So so he's getting bigger and bigger. 6'7", though. 6'7". It's like, uh, you guys, a lot of you are probably too young, but there's was it Ted Hendricks, that was his name, the, the mad stork, uh, ended his career at the at, with the Raiders. Big, tall, ragey guy. Um, Hall of Famer, you guys. Uh, so th this... So he, it's, he's in his mold. We saw him when he drops back. He, you, the quarterback it just changes the dynamic of the quarterback having to make throws of small windows. And if he's the under and he's trying, and the quarterback's trying to throw over the top of a, a linebacker at six seven, that makes his job a lot harder. And we saw a lot of those turnovers in 2022 were created by the disruption that is uh, Eric Gentry. So getting him onto the field is go probably going to be something special. And uh, Lynn did say that he could see him playing all three linebacker positions, right? If they pull, so if they, they pull the, the nickel back or if they pull their a nickel back off the, off the field, they'll bring a third I I linebacker inside linebacker in with like a Sam linebacker on the strong side. And he said he could play any one of those three positions. So your odds of seeing Eric Gentry a lot on the field this year, I think are pretty damn high. I just think that the way Lid talked about him, his special gifts, his just his just skill set, and his and again his frame and the disruption that he causes, I really hope he gets out there uh, quite a bit. Matt, any th more thoughts on the linebackers? Oh, well, one more thing. Sorry, before you go, Matt. Go ahead. go ahead. I haven't even started to talk about. I and mean, he's he's young. He's an incoming freshman. Uh, is Elijah Newby? Uh, I think he's one of the most underrated linebackers in the nation last year. Uh, you're talking about a guy who's like six foot three, two ten already. But the thing about him is he's run and he 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 is fast, like literally legit track speed linebacker out there at that size. I'm wondering how they're gonna slowly get him. You get, I know we'll see him early. I bet we'll see him early on special teams. But I, I'm wondering how quickly they get him, you know, in and and, and playing. I'm not sure. Um, I should have checked if he's a spring enrollee or not. But uh, it's gonna be fun to see him out there as well. Um, go ahead. Sorry, Matt. Yeah, I just want to circle back on Gentry. Yeah, the coaching staff seems very intent and very uh, aware of and focused on the need to make sure that Eric Gentry uh, keeps up his weight and is physically powerful. And like that, that's very encouraging because 
the coaching staff knows that Gentry, you know, he, like in terms of pass coverage, getting deflections, that he has that covered. Speed, range, uh, getting hands in passing lanes, like that part, that Eric Gentry doesn't need to worry about that. It's about how he stands up and run support and making sure that his body is tough enough, thick enough, powerful enough to not get overwhelmed by, I mean, okay, USC's not playing Utah anymore, uh, but, you know, in the Big Ten, you're still going up against very physical, uh, thick, beefy offensive lines. Gentry will need to be powerful enough to, to take the punishment uh, that goes with uh, playing the run, especially in the Big Ten. So the fact that the coaching staff is cognizant and really making it a point for Gentry to maintain a significant weight and, and to uh, firm up his body, that's really important. That's going to be a major thing to, to watch with him. And, you know, that's what's going to be, uh, you know, an obvious central storyline of spring ball in general, not just for the linebackers, but for everyone. You know, how are we seeing the weight and strength training uh, beginning to take effect? And, and will USC have, you know, more presence? Will, will USC be more robust? on the lines at linebacker, you know, in terms of being able to create a newly physical culture and identity on defense, getting away from the Alex Grinch uh, speed D and the finesse look, um, you know, all of that is going to be, you know, at, at the very center of the conversation when we get into spring ball and these guys are on the field for practices. Yeah. I didn't see a lot of names in there, but, um, we did have uh, Zobby with Davis and Gentry. I think that's a I think that's a very strong possibility of that that couple there. I I, I would say though, I, I, it's going to be a competition. But you know, the Easton Macarius, Arnold coming down, and Cobb and Gentry, those guys are all going to battle. I think they're all battling it out. Those guys because I I think the common denominator. I don't know. I, I have nothing to base this on. But I just think they're going to get um, uh, Gentry out there quite a bit. And I, listen, I will take any one of those other three options alongside. Uh, Eric would be more than more than happy again because the key is here. It's going to be with the new coaching staff. It's going to be with that new system. It's going to be with Matt Entz a whole you know a whole spring with Matt Entz whole fall camp and then we'll really see when we roll in to Vegas to go against LSU. Those linebackers have to play out of their mind and whatever those two are, they are going to need to be ready for that game. That that you can assure yourself of. Again, uh, a, uh, a lot of other here we go. Here we go. Just want to get this uh, super chat. Adam, thank you for the, the $15 uh, uh, super chat. And, uh, you know, have your uh, a critique of Caleb Williams a, a, as well. Um, but Adam has also been making comments about uh, Alex Grinch and why it's not all his fault. But Adam, here, here's, here's what I want to say about Alex Grinch. Uh, it, you know, it, in terms of uh, the larger critique of my critique of, you know, putting it all at Alex Grinch's feet. Adam, you know, Mason Cobb came to USC uh, having done some really good work at Oklahoma State. You know, like Mason Cobb achieved something at Oklahoma State. He helped the Cowboys uh, under Mike Gundy become a really good team in the Big 12. And I know that Gundy, you know, does amazing things at Oklahoma State on a regular basis. I mean, you know, he he got Oklahoma State to the uh, Big 12 title game last season, not just a few years ago. Um, but the point is, Adam, that Mason Cobb had good years. He had good productive years at Oklahoma State, widely acknowledged as a very good, I would say, above average college football linebacker at Oklahoma State. So when he comes to USC. He was not an above average football player. So he clearly declined. All right. Let's also take Christian Roland Wallace. Now, not a linebacker, but nevertheless, highly touted player coming from Arizona. USC fans had reason to think, oh, we're getting a really good addition to our secondary, uh, you know, from Arizona. Christian Roland Wallace did not play at USC at the level he played at Arizona. So, you know, when you're getting guys from other places who have already established themselves to a certain degree, let's be clear about that. It's not as though Mason Cobb and Christian Roland Wallace were transfers that were mystery players that had barely gotten any reps, small sample size, you know, untested, unproven. No, they were proven players 
at least going by their previous stops. Mason Cobb did play well at Oklahoma State. Christian Ron Moss did play well at Arizona. <laughs> they had already established themselves within college football as good players. Like they had good reps on film, good results on tape, and the Nautilus Squinch took them and made them worse. So, so that is the kind of thing where I can say, you know what? It's not just the players. It's a coach not only failing to improve, but actually failing, you know, getting work, making players worse than they came in from other programs. So, you know, when, when you have not just a lack of forward development, but you have actually regression, that we, it was regression, not just failure to improve. You know, sometimes in politics, people will say, you know, a, 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 an in, a decrease in the rate of increase is a cut. No, it's not a cut when the level of, of increase, you know, declines. That's just kind of a, you know, just a slower growth pattern. You actually need to cut, reduce, and toto uh, in order for that to be called a cut. So we don't want to play the semantics game you know, improving less than you did before, that's still an improvement. But under Alex Grinch, you saw net regression from Cobb and Chris and Roland Wallace, uh, two guys I mentioned, but you saw it elsewhere uh, throughout that defense. So when you have outright regression from players who have proven themselves in other places, based on that, yes, I can actually lay the blame at the feet of Alex Grinch and sleep very peacefully at night. But Adam, thanks for the super chat. We really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a couple more super chats. We might as well hit right now. Uh, Danny Kennedy, thank you so much for your three-year member uh, for your three-month membership. Great supporter. Um, hello to you as well. And then I did see your comment. Uh, I think I put it up there, but you sent me as we sent a second one here with the super chat and just kind of echoing what echoing what Matt has uh, eloquently said uh, that basically. You got guys playing, you know, very well at our schools. We bring them in and they regress. Is that the player or is that the system? Is that the is that the position coaching? What what is the common denominator there? Obviously, when they're coming in as freshmen and playing outstanding, and then you know their sophomore junior year they come on in and, and then they regress. That you know, or senior year even, especially senior year, uh, that 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 tells you something. That shows you something, especially when they put them, you know, maybe even put them out of position as we talked about last week. So, yeah, all great points. Danny, thank you so much for the Super Chat, and also thank you so much for being a member. While we're at it, I might as well do it. Thank you guys all for being here. we got about 86 people right now here in the middle, you know, beginning of March and really the deadest time of the year, and you guys are here. We just want to thank you from all of our hearts. Uh, you guys make this show happen. Uh, appreciate you being here. But if you could and you're not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button. That way you know, uh, and hit the notification bell. That way you know when we're live. I uh, appreciate you all, everyone being here tonight. Um, so this happened. Uh, the women's hoops uh, decided to upstage the men and win the uh, the turn. The they didn't win the regular season, correct, Matt? That was that was one. Who won the regular Stanford. season? Um, Stanford. Stanford. But USC avenged that by winning uh, in the the tournament, the Pac-12 tournament. Beating Stanford to take the title, the la the final uh, Pac-12 tournament championship goes to the women of Troy. Uh, they are now currently ranked number three, which is their highest rating ranking they've had since 1986. Since most of you guys were even born, uh, some of you guys weren't born. 1986, uh, the, the last time USC was ranked higher uh, than number three. Uh, Matt, I know you have been covering the women's hoops extensively at. Uh, at Trojan's Wire, uh, if you want to say, I know you told me before the show, you said this is a voice of college football, but I don't think we can let this moment go by without just paying homage to the women of Troy and what a great run, the great season they had, and especially Gottlieb, what she's done with this team. Such a short turnaround in, what, three years, two years, and what she's yep. been able to do turn the program around. Yeah, this is the voice of college football. I, I would really just invite all of you guys, follow our coverage of this amazing special team at Trojan's Wire. You know, this this team deserves the readership, deserves the and it deserves the coverage from me. Like I need to honor these women with my coverage at Trojans Wire. I've spent most of my time the past week doing that. So I really hope you'll read and share and you'll learn to love this team 
and you might not be into basketball, you especially might not be into women's basketball, read the stories, read the quotes from the weekend, the win over Stanford. You'll learn to love this team. I would just say USC is about to get a number one seed in the NCAA tournament for the first time since that same year, 1986, when the Trojans were last ranked in the top uh, number three uh, in the AP poll, as Tim mentioned. So the, and that was Cheryl Miller. That was the, doc, the first dynasty in the era of the women's NCAA tournament, which began in 82. USC was the first program to win two national titles, you know, two NCAA tournaments. And it was the first program to make three uh, NCAA uh, championship games as well. And that was Cheryl Miller. That was, you know, at the very beginning of, of the women's basketball's rise uh, to prominence. So follow this team and follow Trojans Wire. We could, we really appreciate your readership there. Obviously, when spring football gets rolling, that's our main focus. We know, we know that's where our bread is buttered at Trojans Wire, and it's what our community comes here for. But this women's basketball team is really, really special, and there's a lot to learn, a lot to love about this team. If you haven't followed the, our coverage of the Stanford game, just go to Trojans Wire. Spend 15 minutes. You'll enjoy what you read. Guarantee it. Lots and lots of information um, there. McKen uh, sorry, um, Mackenzie Forbes got uh, of the tournament. She was most outstanding player of the tournament. She's a guard for the Trojans. Uh, just there's fun to watch. You watch um, Kayla Padilla. That She just lights out shooter from the outside. It's just, just amazing. I know that Juju Watkins gets a lot of the attention, but again, this, this is a team. This is a solid team that's going to really put their mark on this year's tournament. I, I advise all Trojans, if you are sports fans, I hear it all the time, oh, women's basketball, watch one game and tell me what you think of it because, the, again, the, these ladies out there are, are tearing up. So go out and support your Trojans uh, in the tournament. Yeah, just, just an amazing run. Speaking really quickly of basketball, and then we'll get off it really quickly, the men, uh, shocker, decided to uh, show them, show this basically the country what this team could do. Would they all come together? And it's funny enough is, is – Boogie Ellis had a great game defensively, but not offensively. But he played, he did, he had a great game defensively, uh, shutting down Love uh, for the Wildcats. One of the leading, I think he's number four scorer in the Pac-12. Just absolutely Blakely. The defense did a great job of the perimeter defense, um, and shocked at number five Arizona at home. And believe me, you guys, listen. There are no more annoying fans, no more annoying fans on the planet. And then the Arizona basketball fan. I will tell you that right now. Uh, you have to you have to applaud the way they. Well, they don't travel. As part, there's a bunch of you know a bunch of uh, Arizona uh, fans living in L.A. and they come and they packed Poly Pavilion. And when they blew the doors off of Poly Pavilion, they let the Bruin fans know it. They're loud. They're proud. And they were in it early in this game. But you guys, they, they got quiet down the stretch there because these Trojans. You should be proud of them as well. Really shut down this Wildcat team. Uh, Matt, your thoughts on the game really quickly? Well, Arizona's worn out USC for several games and, and has been really USC's kryptonite in the Pac-12. So this was role reversal. But of course, just to turn the page this week, if USC gets by Washington on Wednesday in the first round of the Pac-12 men's tournament, Arizona's waiting in the quarters Thursday at noon uh, in Vegas. So USC is going to need to beat Arizona a second time if it wants to make a real run at that automatic bid for the NCAA tournament. Thursday at noon, if USC handles Washington on Wednesday. Yeah, I got the bracket. Trojan's wife, if you want to go check it out, uh, that just went up today. Uh, this this win over the Wildcats was the first time in six attempts. I mean, they they really have had USC's number, uh, but it shows you why in the preseason media poll, USC was picked second in the by, by the media. Uh, they they had the players. Boogie was coming back. You know, you get Isaiah Collier, the top uh, recruit, the college recruit, and um, and then you had Bronny James come. He's another top thirty recruit come uh, come in and and show what they could do. It took a little while. I talked about it. You know, if you want to go ahead and read over Twitter, where took a little while to get caught up to the college game. But once they did, and both of them are playing lights out ball right now, as well as the rest of the team. Uh, hats off to Andy Enfield, who's been under fire uh, a lot this season. Uh, he made it very clear that, you know, when they lost Isaiah Collier and Boogie Ellis, who were their two leading scorers, for an extended period of time, they won that six-game skid. It did kind of dampen, put a huge damper on the season. But they've won five of the last seven, and I think it's like four of the last five. And the one they did lose was in overtime, correct, Matt? So and up, up in the Palouse. So, I mean, you know, this this is a team that can make a run. And as Matt said, 
The teams are going to play. They have beaten. Now, Matt, you told me last night, okay, it's one thing to beat Arizona, but but to beat them twice, especially the tournament, that's a tall ask. But if USC could do that, as Matt very well told me, uh, they've got a really good chance of running this thing down, and they'll face them in the second round. So if USC can play, and I'll say this, if USC plays to their potential, they can play with anybody in the Pac-12, without a doubt. So don't count these guys out. They're a long shot to do it. But, uh, you know, get behind your Trojans. Get out to Vegas if you can, but definitely tune in to watch them. I think they should uh, they, they should change their minds going into the season. Well, that's really all I had for hoops. Uh, that's all we really had for spring ball. We're going to cover a little more extensively later on. Uh, if you guys last chance to get some questions, if you have some questions for us, USCJ, I see you out there. Fight on. Yeah. Hey, listen, I need you to, I need to send me one. It's getting a little bit dirty here. I, mean, I, wear, I, wore, I wore the heck out of this thing for about a good two months solid. Um, I brought out a retirement, but I hope it's not show up on screen. But I mean, I'm, 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 I need, I need a new one. So, um, personal plug. There. Uh, all of goats is taking the day off. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I've worn that for like two uh, a month and a month straight, and I got too many Hall and Oates jokes. <laughs> Some were pretty good, <laughs> but um, but yeah, we got we got to move on to a different hat. Um, yeah. what else do we have? Day. Super chats. Pro day. Pro day, yeah. March twentieth. Pro day coming on the twentieth. So, Obviously, next week that takes center stage, but you know that's coming up pretty much just a week away. And of course, with all the scrutiny being visited toward USC prospects, you know this is a, this is you're going to get a lot of stuff on, of course, Caleb Williams throwing, and also on Taj Washington's catching. I think Taj Washington, that's a guy worth coming back to for USC's pro day because you know Trojan fans know this, and, and on draft day. Uh, a couple years ago, you know, I I said this like, wait, Armand Ross St. Brown fell to 112 in the fourth round, day three. Like N NFL teams are going to regret that. Like they they were underestimating Armand Ross St. Brown, and and he has proved everyone wrong. Like he has really shoved it in the faces of NFL teams that needed a receiver and were there at 70, 80, 90 you know, on the back end of day two, Friday, in the third round. And the Lions got one of the biggest steals of that draft, getting Amon Ross St. Brown at 112, uh, just early into day three in the fourth round. Taj Washington can be that guy. I think that uh, he, Taj Washington is being underestimated uh, in much the same way that Amon Ross St. Brown has been now. Am I going to say that Taj Washington is going to be every bit the NFL player Amon Ross St. Brown will be? No, I'm not, I'm not going to say that because Amon Ross St. Brown has set a very, very high standard. And so certainly don't want to put that level of pressure on Taj Washington's shoulders. But I do think Taj Washington is an NFL quality possession receiver. You know, I don't see him making tons of splash plays, but I do think, and, and this is St. Brown's best attribute. He has lots of attributes, but his best one is third and five, need six yards, you throw the ball to Amon Ross St. Brown. And I think Taj Washington uh, can be that kind of guy. That's the role for him uh, in the NFL. So I'm really hoping that he shows out well at USC's Pro Day. He has a chance to make a significant amount of coin uh, at this Pro Day. And, and he's the guy I'm probably going to be looking at more than most uh, on March 20th. That's a Wednesday. Uh, USC's pro day next week. Technician, polished routes, strong hands. I mean, there's a lot. There are a lot of comparisons between those two, and I agree with you that the fact that they let, you know, the sun god drop as far as they did, um, is going to have some scouts looking. And and I, I really do. I think Taj Washington. He was underrated. You know, coming into the season as a receiver, everyone has always overlooked Taj Washington. Uh, I think Taj is going to cook in the NFL, and I do hope that a team does take a, a flyer, and I think they will be very happy with him. I agree. Um, Going to be exciting to see uh, how he does on his pro day. And I would just add, you know, with with NFL teams diving at breadcrumbs for quarterbacks, like the Patriots got Jacoby Brissett, you know, the, the Raiders got Gardner Minshew. What are these NFL teams doing going for these mediocre quarterbacks? So I hope that Taj Washington not only gets a good draft placement on the big board, but then he goes to a good – a, play, a good organization with a good quarterback too. <laughs> That's also a part of it. You know, don't want him to be stuck in quarterback purgatory. Uh, you know, in an organization that doesn't have other pieces because that would set him up to fail. 
but hopefully he'll go to a good org. Like, please, not the Giants. <laughs> not that sinking ship. Just lost Saquon Barkley to the Eagles today uh, in free agency. Uh, like, that offense is going to be bad. So wouldn't want the Giants or some other really bad NFL offenses. Carolina Panthers, like, that, that's a situation set up for failure as well. Hope he gets the right fit and a good draft position uh, in, in the upcoming late April draft. You know, you're going to have LV Live coming after you, trashing his, trashing his Giants, but we'll see. We'll see. About Giants that. deserve to be trashed, folks. Like, you, you, you can't look at that organization and say they're on the right track. I mean, I know they got burns from the Panthers. They beefed up their defense, but that offense is going to be bad. Betting Giants unders in 2024, that's going to be a hot ticket. Um, and then uh, we had that we had Adam. Uh, then Matt, how are how were we so good against Notre Dame, but so bad against Utah? <clears throat> we were good against Notre Dame. What were we good about? Uh, that, uh, are we talking the same game? On defense, he's talking about Grinch. Grinch had a good game. Oh, right. That's what we call that's what we call in the business an outlier. Also, also Notre Dame's Jared Parker was one of the worst offensive coordinators in the country and Sam Hartman did not impress at quarterback. Like Sam Hartman turned out to be, if not a bust, he certainly underwhelmed. So the combination of offensive coordinator uh, and quarterback, not very good at Notre Dame. Uh, now, now against Utah, Bryson Barnes, like Bryson Barnes is not better than, than Sam Hartman, but Utah has much better coaching and, and Andy Ludwig as a play caller, far, far better than Jared Parker. So the co the coaching for Utah was a lot better on the offensive side of the ball than Notre Dame. And at the time, I think I gave a lot of credit to the defense in, in that game. They played well. They played better. They had, but at the same time, the 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 yards were a bit skewed simply because of the fact all the short fields that they had and the, the weird possessions that they did have. I did believe that was one of their better games they played defensively, but it was nothing to hang their hat on. I mean, it would have been nice maybe to get a stop. And I know that they, that three, you know, a couple times around the doorstep, but you know, that uh, the third one where the, the turnovers at midfield and they just marched right down the field and scored that touchdown as well. So, I mean, we'll see that the, the Utah game was inexcusable. That's the one that will haunt me forever. Losing that third game in a row to Utah, the way that, it wasn't the loss to Utah. It was the fact that that was not a good Utah offense that we made look spectacular. Um, I forgot the converted safety's name they had playing running back. What was his name again? Sort of the V Vaki, I think. Vaki, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it made we made him look like Christian McCaffrey doing wheel routes. I mean, you know. Yeah, and and, and Alex Grinch said we didn't see it on film. It was one of the first plays of Utah's previous game against Cal the week before. That was yeah. a wheel route on film. Yes, yeah, that that was a painful. That that game was really, again, lo any losing any game is bad, but the way you lose some of these games, it's just like you just. You 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 tear victory for the claws of defeat, you know, it's, or whatever the phrase. I can't really I botched it, but I pulled a Brian Kelly. Sorry, but you know, you're just absolutely painful to have a win. Everyone's celebrating, you know, you, that great run by Caleb, and then you just call yourself. You look up the clock. You go, oh crap! Like you almost knew what was going to go down. So, um, hey, let's get past 2023. Move on to 2024. We got spring ball coming up. Like we said, you got pro day. Make sure you guys tune into that. You guys on NFL Network, you can get loud, get proud on social media behind our Trojans for their pro day. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to see a lot of you guys out there for uh, get start making your plans for April 20th. April 20th is going to be the spring game. I would love to see all of you guys out there. Maybe, maybe we can try to do a meetup. You know, maybe we could have a maybe we have a Trojan Conquest live meetup. That would be fun. Um, let me know if there's any interest in that. But that's that's another week. But I will not allow a week go by without talking about one more thing. You know, listen, it's 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 getting redundant, and I'm just gonna basically say it. They need to get this man's trophy back. It's been, I mean, I, I can't get rid of this. Sorry, I can't even see how many days it's been. It's been four thousand nine hundred sixteen days since they stole this man's trophy. It's time to give it back. Fight on, Reggie. I know the momentum's on your side. It's coming. It's coming. Be patient because um, more and more Trojans are getting behind them. 
You have uh, just the news last was it last week when Manziel came out and said he's going to be boycotting. We asked the question at Trojans Wire, you know, who else is going to get behind this in the boycott? Let's see if that can build some momentum. Uh, Reggie, good luck. Hope you get your trophy back and hope we get our wins back. All that stuff should be coming back to, to the Trojans very, very soon, Trojan fans. So uh, we can remove all the stupid asterisks that we had to deal with for the past decade or, or actually 15 years. Jeez. Well, Matt, I think that's it. I think we've covered it all. Uh, unless there's anything else you wanted to cover before we get out of here. Uh, make sure you guys next Friday you, you tune in. We always have our call-in show on Fridays. Every Friday we have the call-in show. Um, it will be at 6 o'clock Pacific, 9 o'clock Eastern. It's your show. Call with your ideas, your thoughts, what you want to talk about. And the good news is we haven't been getting a lot of phone calls. So if you do call in, the wait won't be very long. So <laughs> feel free to give us a call during the dead period. Matt, any last words? Nope. All right. Make sure you catch us over on Trojans Wire. Until Friday, uh, fight on Trojans, and uh, we'll see you soon.